Hi everybody and welcome to this week's edition of It's a Fair Question. Today I'm talking with Martin Johnston. There are few people anywhere I have higher regard for than Martin Johnston. He has an authenticity about him, an integrity and an absolute commitment to working for those things that matter to him, not least for justice and fairness. So let's crack on, let's see what Martin has to say. Martin Johnson. Martin, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm delighted that you've carved out some time to do this. Among other things, you are working now for the Trussell Trust. Now they, alongside other providers, uh, are operating food banks across the length and breadth of the country. That's a good thing, isn't it? That people are caring for those who are struggling. It's absolutely, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and, and actually when you see the generosity of people, uh, I don't know, as we are now able more and more to go into supermarkets and see those like baskets or whatever that are being filled up by people with real generosity thinking about people who are struggling i suspect i've always had a real ambiguity about that you know wouldn't it look so much better if in actual fact we didn't need food banks in what is the sixth richest country on the planet uh, we end up thinking that the way we deal with food poverty and food insecurity is putting an extra tin of beans uh, in a basket as we leave a supermarket. There's something not quite right about that, is there, Martin? No, I hear you absolutely, but let's just imagine people are listening to this and they're thinking, well, that's, you know, that's what I can do. You know, what's, your, what's your solution? Is there another way? And then let me just pick up on something you posted on social media last week, Martin. You were, you were saying that once food banks are there, which they very clearly are, it's quite difficult to roll that back uh, and get to a place where maybe there are no food banks. Yes, yeah, so I think that's going to be a long journey for us to actually move to that need, that as getting rid of the need for food banks. And in anything I say, one, I kind of want to celebrate the generosity of people who give to food banks. I want to celebrate the generosity of people who volunteer within food banks. I want to ensure that when people do feel that they have to go to food banks, that that is as dignified and as wholesome a thing as possible. But we can think do better. Um, so if I were to take an example, and it's a, it's a pre-COVID example, but if I were to say that the great majority of people who end up going to food banks end up going because of failings within our benefit system. So they end up going, for example, because when you go on to universal credit, the first five weeks that you're in universal credit, you don't necessarily get any money. Now, what does that look like if instead of that being five weeks, it was a far shorter period of time where people could get help immediately? So those sort of things are the things that, that slowly over a period of time do away with the need for food banks. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And yet I want to just keep thinking this through. And what you're talking about there, if I'm hearing you right, is that our structures need to be different. Our systems need to be different by way of how our, our, our government operates. Let me put it that way. Now, if that was all happening as you might want to see it, would that do away with the need for charity? And are you essentially saying that it would be better if there was no need for charity. I, am I hearing you right or wrongly? So I think what I'm trying to say is I think that there is an infinity loop 
that needs to go on between charity and justice. And that quite often some of us get stuck in the world of just charity. And actually quite often in that world of charity, we end up, if we are able to give to others, we end up feeling good about ourselves and not necessarily thinking about how hard that is for the person who's receiving charity. But that charity is really, really, really important. But it needs somehow to connect with a loop of justice, which says, why is that needed? And, and I also spend quite a lot of my time in the world of people who are preoccupied with issues of justice. And actually, the truth of the matter is, Martin, a number of them would be terrified of volunteering within a food bank because they wouldn't want to see up close the failings of our system. They would rather send letters or campaign or whatever. And so that group of people need to be encouraged into thinking about charity and the group of people who are involved in charity need to be thinking about justice. And actually by creating, instead of two separate circles, we're actually creating an infinity loop that I think we really, really begin to tackle. Uh, the sort of problems that we've got that arise out of generosity and justice working together. Okay, thank you. I, I want to come back to the question of justice, but before we move on from food banks per se, let me ask you a little bit more about how the Trussell Trust operates. Uh, can you give us an idea of the scale of its operation across Scotland or perhaps more widely the UK? Okay, so in some ways I'm probably not the best person to do that. Um, we have hundreds of locally owned, locally led food banks across the UK. Um, and each of those local food banks work out how is the best way of providing emergency food aid uh, to people uh, and also how some of the best ways of ensuring that people get the money that they need so that they can buy the food. Um, Trussell Trust, if you like, sits as an organisation underneath those food banks trying to support them, but also trying to campaign on some of the changes that we believe are necessary uh, in our society. Okay, thank you for that. Now, we've heard much of a hashtag in recent times through the COVID pandemic as people are looking forward, and that hashtag is build back better. Uh, and then a couple of weeks ago, I heard our Prime Minister tweak it somewhat or somewhat radically, and he made it build, 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 which probably sounded great to the, the construction industry. But again, in social media, I saw you recently had come up with another version, or maybe you were quoting it, and it was this, build back with, build back with. Can you unpack what you're getting at with that phrase? So Sam Wells, who's the uh, rector, the, the priest in charge at St. Martin's in the fields in Trafalgar Square, just off Trafalgar Square, says the most important word in the gospel is with, is the word with. Uh, and the, what we tend to do is we tend to do things to people or we tend to do things for people. But in actual fact, the gospel is about doing things with people. And for me, that build back better, which I would absolutely agree that we need a different way of working. Don't actually think it is about building and building and building and building. Uh, but I think we need a way of changing the things that clearly were not working for folk before these awful days have hit us. 
but the, there is a danger that if you just have the same people who were making decisions before this happened in the room now, then in actual fact, they, we, and I include you and I in that, end up simply making the same mistakes as we've made in the past. So I'm really interested in who are the people who were not involved in creating a better system before this? And how might that group of people, who I think are overwhelmingly people who are at the margins of our society and our world, how might they be really involved in this building back better, but instead of building back better and will eventually get round to talking to some of those who are struggling against poverty, how do we ensure that they're there at the beginning and that they're involved right at the very start of this process? So that perhaps takes us into some of your work with the Poverty Truth Commission that you've been entirely involved with and committed to for some years now. Maybe you could give us some examples. Um, I hear absolutely what you're saying, but maybe are thinking, people are thinking, well, well, what do you mean? I mean, how, for example, might that work? Is there anything from the work with the Poverty Truth Commission that you could point to as saying, well, this in, in, in actuality is what I'm talking about here? Okay, so I can think of, of lots of examples. Uh, let me just give you a wee tiny example. So in one of our commissions, we were involved with uh, kinship carers. So grandparents who found themselves looking after their grandchildren because for a variety of reasons, mum and dad weren't able to do so. And policy kind of said um, these grandparents need lots of support. Uh, you wouldn't disagree with that, would you? Um, then someone came up with the idea of, well, one of the ways that we can support those grandparents is about helping them to learn how to cook effectively. Uh, and so a whole pile of money was put into providing cooking lessons for grandparents so that they could cook stuff for their grandchildren. And I always remember one of our kinship carers who was part of our Poverty Truth Commission, and I'll miss out some of the language that she used, but basically she said, you know, I don't need people being paid money to teach me how to cook mints and tatties. Uh, what I need is money being spent, and it's maybe the same money, but the money being spent actually ensuring that my grandson, who's never had a decent night's sleep in his life because he was born to addicted parents, um, is actually given the psychological support that he needs. Now, I think as a result of that, incredibly common sense approach, we were able to kind of begin to shift some of the ways that money around supporting those families uh, were, was able to be spent. You know, in another example, a big housing provider uh, actually being told that sending eviction notices or sending notices from the bailiffs that came in brown envelopes that meant that you knew that what that envelope meant so you never ever opened it uh, with their expertise and their advice actually designing systems whereby actually you have a conversation with people about how they're maybe struggling to pay their rent and what are the ways that people can be supported and helped in that. So in some ways, those very small practical things but make a huge difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe more important in all of that, though, Martin, is that you and I both know that when actually we are involved in making decisions about our own lives, we feel better about those decisions, 
even if they're not always the things that we would have wanted. And so when people are not involved in decisions that they want, then actually it diminishes them in exactly the same way as it would diminish us. So you're suggesting that actually, in some ways we need to get out of the way and let people take ownership of their own situations, uh, be absolutely involved in the planning and the decision making around how our society works. Uh, is that about the size of it? Yeah, so the strap line of the Poverty Truth Commission that picks it up from the black civil rights movement and from the disability movement is this very simple but wonderful phrase of nothing about us without us is for us. And it's simply that idea, uh, that lived idea that actually if you want to make a difference, then you have to be involved in making that difference. Okay, so let's look like a, um, a wee country like Scotland. It's very clear that we've got disparity. There are plenty of people who are doing very well and are comfortable in it. You and me would be among that group. And we have others who are in a quite different place. Now, can we actually ever realistically hope to change that? And let me just throw in here at this point a line from Jesus, no less, that sometimes I hear people saying, when Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. Now, in one way you could interpret that as saying, look, all these efforts you're talking about, it isn't really going to make that much difference. You've been working in this for decades now. How hopeful or otherwise are you that we can change things for the better? Okay, so... I would probably, I'd say a couple of things in that, but first would be a question back to you. As a person like me, who is comfortable, are you happy to live in a Scotland where there are people who don't know where their next meal is coming from, or would you want something better? Yeah, and I can answer that very simply. And, and the answer to that is why I became a minister in many ways. Uh, as a teenager, uh, looking out at the society around me, uh, you know, in Glasgow, I just, you know, my eyes were opening. I'm thinking, this can't be right. So there's my motivation. Um, yeah, and I guess you're coming from a similar place. I'm coming from a similar place. But, you know, the, the reality of that is that I think the great majority of people in Scotland, I think I do believe this, would want a fairer, more equal, more just society. A bit of our problem is that sometimes we don't rub up against mm. people for whom life is really, really difficult and therefore we don't know those experiences. So we end up having myths or ideas about why people are struggling that aren't actually real. Um, but I think most of us want that better. Now you asked me about Jesus' statement about the poor you will always have with you. I think I'm quite clear that what Jesus was talking about there was about what the church talks about as sin. So when he said, the poor you will always have with you, he was not saying, so just, you know, wipe your hands and go on with the inequality and make things worse. He was saying, actually, we live as sinful individuals in a sinful world. And for as long as that sin exists, poverty will exist as a consequence of that sin. Now, if you and I are in the business of redemption and the overcoming of sin, then in actual fact we are in the business of saying we can live in a world where actually poverty is a thing of the past because sin is a thing of the past. Now we might never ever see that and that will never ever come 
until the kingdom of God is realized in total. But that does not mean for a moment that we do not stop working for the kingdom of God every moment and every day of our lives. Your passion for justice and this whole subject just oozes out from you, Martin. That's always been the case ever since I've known you. But let me ask you quite personally, do you ever get downcast? Do you ever get not so much cynical, but maybe just thinking, oh, I'm just getting nowhere here. One step forward and two back. Ever feel like that? Yeah, so I think most of us feel like that at times. Um, I talked about the kingdom of God a minute ago, and Jesus's parables of the kingdom, I think, are without exception, all about small, temporary, fragile things. Um, and so in a way, one of the ways that I try to remain hopeful is to actually see the small successes even in the midst of really difficult long-term problems. I've got a really good friend who would talk about uh, small steps, big successes. And I think if we are able to see the work that we're involved in through the lens of the kingdom of God, um, then we're able to see the the small things that actually are life transforming and system transforming that actually keep us going on the journey. I think for me also, um, I can get downhearted, but if I'm in a community of people, mm. then people hold me up at the moment when I'm downhearted in the same way that I would hope to hold them up at the moment that they're downhearted. So I think it's one of the reasons why the Christian faith that you and I both are so passionate about is, is not simply an individual relationship. It's about a community of people being together uh, and being together with God. Now, you mentioned the Christian faith. Let's just imagine there's somebody who doesn't necessarily know much about church, has no great involvement with Christian faith, but they maybe have this idea that a Christian is someone who goes to church on a Sunday, and of course that may well be true, at least <laughs> once COVID's back and done and dusted. Um, or, you know, a Christian might be someone who prays, a Christian might be someone who read the, reads the Bible, and all of those things, of course, might well be true. But for you, why is the commitment to justice and fairness so important in terms of how you work out and live out your Christian faith? So for me, the Christian faith is clearly at its fullest in the person of Jesus. And God in Jesus became a human being but he didn't just become any human being he became a first century Palestinian Jew living on the edge or at the edge of an empire but also living with struggle uh, with poverty with injustice. So, so for me, why justice matters is I see God in every single human being. I see God in actual fact in every single part of God's wonderful creation. But I see God at God's fullest in the poorest and the most marginalized in the world uh, and in our society. So in actual fact, I cannot do anything else other than be passionate about justice. Because when I see, when I see people being treated unfairly, Martin, 
I see God being treated unfairly. Mm, I hear you. Thank you for that. Martin, let me finish up with this. This may be a bit unfair of me, but I'm going to do it anyway. Let's say our First Minister, she decides she needs a week's holiday. And I think most people would agree she'd probably about deserve that. And she comes on the phone to you and says, Martin, would you handle uh, the Scottish Government for the next week? And she says to you, you can do one thing. I mean, mostly I just want you to look after it until I come back, but you can do one thing when I'm away that maybe would change Scotland in some way. What do you think that would be if you got to be in charge for a short time? What one change or one thing would you do for this country of ours? So the First Minister wouldn't be as daft, but never mind. <laughs> um, I, I suspect if there was one thing it would be to say, if you're going to have a meeting about that particular issue, you need to ensure that at least two or three people at that meeting have direct lived experience of the issue that you're discussing, or the meeting is not allowed to go ahead and you don't get paid. Wow. And I think that if you did that, so in actual fact, you couldn't have a meeting around homelessness unless actually you had three people who knew the direct experience of homelessness in the meeting. Uh, and, and actually all the other experts who are really important, they wouldn't get paid unless there were homeless people in the room. Now, I think that if you could do that for more than a week, if you could do that for six months, or you could do that for a year, then in actual fact, you would change the way our country is run. I think probably I would need to also say, of course, if you did that in the church as well, you would change the way that the church is run. Okay, so I think an email to our First Minister may be in order when I'm finished here to recommend that <laughs> she speaks to you soon. I love the idea, Martin. It seems like what you've suggested would have far-reaching consequences rather than some sort of one-hit wonder that some people might have thought of if they had opportunity to have that authority for a week. I want to say thank you, Martin, very much indeed. Uh, it's Brilliant talking to you as always and not least today. And I'm sure those watching, you'll have given them loads to think about. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Bye for now.